So first of all, thank you all for coming to help me to celebrate my 91 years birthday. And I want to thank uh, Andrew Jordan, Jeff Ferguson, our beloved president, Daniele, everybody else that helped to organize this meeting, which I am going to, I believe, will be quite successful, judging by all the topics of the lectures that are going to be given here. Today I'm going to talk about uh, what is being called a two-vector formulation of quantum mechanics. The idea of this formulation is to say that a quantum particle or any quantum system can have two boundary conditions instead of one. The usual approach before that was that you give one boundary condition that is defined by a measurement that was done on a quantum system. That measurement gives you a vector, and you evolve this vector in time in Hilbert space, and that is the whole description. But in this new formulation, we say we are going to use the fact that even though we know the initial state exactly, there are still many possibilities at a later time, so we can choose one of them and call it a second boundary condition. So that we define in the present the state of a quantum system by two boundary conditions. One vector coming from the measurement in the past to the present, and another vector that comes back from the future to define exactly the present from the future point of view. This is something that could have been done in classical physics, because in classical physics, if you know the initial condition, there is no freedom for, to make any other choice in the future. So we have now a new idea. You know that everybody was very unhappy first when quantum mechanics told us that nature is not deterministic. Two atoms that are exactly the same, one of them may decide to emit a photon after one second, and the other may decide to emit a photon after one hour, and there was absolutely no difference between them. That's what made Einstein crazy. He said, God doesn't play dice. So the, the new idea is that, in fact, there is indeed a difference between the two electrons that started in the same state, but we can find the difference only in the future. Once we found it in the future, we know that already from the beginning, these two electrons that started in the same state were really different. But we can find the difference only later by a future measurement. So let me show you how this formalism works. And then I will show you a number of new insights that came from this uh, new formulation. By the way, I suggest this is a very informal conference, so I encourage people to ask questions not only at the end, but in the middle. I really would like this to happen so that I will make sure that you are not falling asleep and you really try to understand what I am saying. So the idea is the following. Here is, here is time. At time T1, we make a measurement and find the system in the state Psi1. And then we use the time evolution operator to evolve this vector to a later time. Then at finite time t, we measure, make another measurement, and we find the state psi 2, which is different from the time evolution of psi 1. So we make a measurement that can have a number of outcomes, and out of them we only choose the case where we got the outcome psi 2. And the question is now, given this two boundary condition, what happens if I make a measurement at the intermediate time and measure some observable A 
that has a number of Asian, Asian vector psi n with Asian values a n. So the question we are interested in is what is the probability to find one of these this, this vectors and then to find psi 2. So suppose we found the vector psi, I, I suggest to call it phi rather than psi, because I use psi here. So this is phi n. And ask now the question, what is the probability to find one of them given this boundary condition and this boundary condition? So I have here time evolution up to this intermediate time of psi 1. From here on, I have a time evolution of one of the states that I found, say phi n. And then I postulate the state psi 2. So how do I calculate the probability to find that situation? I start with the state psi 1. I evolve it in time from the time t1 to intermediate time t, where this time evolution u of t, t, t1 is equal to e to the minus i, the Hamiltonian, t minus t1 divided by h bar. That's provided the Hamiltonian is not explicitly time dependent. So I start with psi 1, evolve it to the intermediate time t, then I project it on the state phi, n, and now I start with the state phi n and propagate it in time to the final time from the intermediate time t to, to the final time t, and project it finally on the, on the state psi 2. This whole thing gives me an amplitude started with psi 1 in the middle having phi, and then finally at the end psi 2. If I take the absolute value of this square, I will get the probability of starting with psi 1, having phi n in the middle, and ending with psi 2. Now, observe that I can do a trivial mathematical transformation that will not change this amplitude at all, but will give a very interesting new picture. I take this time evolution and bring it here, so I can write a new data of t, t, times psi 2, times phi n, Obviously, this gives me exactly the same amplitude, so I can do the calculation for what happened in the middle using this formulation. But this formulation is a very different picture. It tells me that what happens now, I started with psi 1, evolving in time until the middle. I took psi 2, evolving it back in time, because you, you dug up if u is e to the minus ist, u dagger is e to the plus ist, then the same is reversing the order of time. So I take the vector psi 2, send it in, back in time to the present, bring psi 1 to the present, using both of them on equal footing to calculate what happens in the present. So that suggests an interesting picture saying that instead of having one boundary condition, I can have two boundary conditions to define the president, and they are on equal footing. That's why we call this also a time symmetric formulation. Up to this point, the, the way that people described collapse before 
was kind of irreversible. Because once you did a collapse, you could then you could predict the future, but not predict back the past. But using these two boundary conditions, you see that the picture is time reversal. I can look at it in this order of time, or look at it in this order of time, it will look the same. So we restore the thing that was nice in classical physics. In classical physics, in the microscopic world, every solution is time reversal. You time reverse it, it's also a solution. Before this formulation with the two vectors, it looks as if, in the case of quantum mechanics, even in the microscopic world, there is no time reversibility. But in this picture, we saw the time reversibility. We say if we have the two boundary conditions, the description in the time in between is time reversal, because I can reverse this picture and it will look the same. So that's one nice thing about the two vector formulation. Another nice thing about it is that using this calculation, it is infinitely simpler than using the usual calculation. Because in the usual calculation, for each different outcome in the middle, I have to use another to solve another differential equation to tell me how each one of these vectors involves in time. Here, once and for all, I do the solution for psi 1 and psi 2, and the rest is just scalar product, which is much, much simpler. So certainly, this formulation is much simpler mathematically. It is sign reversal, so it looks very nice. That is how this thing was from the time when I first thought about it, in, when I was a young assistant professor at Yeshiva University. I thought about this time reversibility idea. I came to two professors that were there at Yeshiva, Leibovitch and Peter Bergman. Peter Bergman was actually from Rochester, but he was a visiting professor at Yeshiva University. He was, by the way, also an assistant of Einstein when he was younger. I told them about this idea, and they said they liked it very much, and we published an article together. Of course, I did not write anything there, but uh, it was my idea, so my name was on the article, and that's called now the ABL formulation, our other Bergman label bit. And this is the formulation. Now, this thing was resting like that for many years. And then about 25 or 30 years ago, I started to think about it again. And I came to the following question. Suppose we look at the simplest quantum system that we know about, that is one half, a spin one half. So we have time, we have no diametonic is zero, so the components of the spins are constants of the motion. At time t1, I measure the spin and find that sigma x is equal to plus one. And at time t2, I measure sigma y and find it to be equal to 1. So now I have two boundary conditions from the time in between. From the past boundary condition, I know that sigma x is equal to 1. From the future boundary condition, I know that sigma y is equal to 1. So I have this past vector propagating, saying that all the time sigma x was equal to 1. And there is the future vector propagated back. They tell me all the time sigma y was equal to 1. Now, I started to look at it again and said, maybe I should take this picture more seriously. Up to now, we, I used the picture of the two vectors only to make calculation for experiment in the middle. Now I look at it before I discuss any experiment in the middle and say, what's going on? Is it true that in the time in between, both things are known? How is it possible? I, I know that if sigma y, sigma y x is known, I couldn't know sigma y. And here, this picture, if I believe it, 
tells me that both of them are known in the middle. What's going on? So I started to, to ask myself the question, can I find some measurement that will tell me that indeed both of them were equal to one in the time in between? So what kind of measurement? Of course, if I measure only sigma x, definitely I will find one because it was one before and it's conserved. If instead I measure sigma y, I know I can find one or minus one. But by agreement, I'm going to look only in those cases that I found at the end one and discard all the cases that I found minus one. But that is trivial. I mean, of course, I, I found that sigma y is equal to one only because I, I discarded the other one. So that doesn't give me any idea that both of them were there together. So then I asked the question, maybe I should look at what happens if I measure a single measurement for sigma x plus sigma y. Ah, if sigma x is equal to 1 and sigma y is equal to 1, I must guess the value 2. But I looked at it for a minute and said, but that's crazy. If I divide it by square root of 2, I will get a value of square root of 2, but that thing, sigma x plus sigma y divided by square root of 2, is a spin component in the 45 degrees between x and y. That spin component can be only 1 and minus 1, never square root of 2. So, right away, my formalism leads me astray. It suggested that I should get the value of square root of 2, and it cannot be. So, should I throw away this picture and say it doesn't tell me anything about reality? I didn't give up. So I started to see what's going on here. Why doesn't it work? Then I realized that if I try to measure sigma x plus sigma y, I do it by introducing a magnetic field, an inhomogeneous magnetic field in the cell here, in a homogeneous mag magnetic field in the direction of x plus y. That magnetic field necessarily makes a precession around it and makes both sigma x and sigma y changing because they have to precess. And I destroy by this measurement exactly what I want to see. I want to see that sigma x is equal to 1, but this measurement immediately starts to change it by an uncertain amount, so I was not able to see it because the measurement destroyed what I wanted to see. So, what could we do? What could we do? Then it occurred to me maybe I should consider a very, very weak interaction between the measuring device and the system. That is later, I call it weak measurement. So the idea of weak measurement is to come indeed and introduce a very inhomogeneous magnetic field in the x plus y direction, but introduce a very, very weak magnetic field. It's so weak that it will not disturb sigma x and will not disturb sigma y, but then, of course, I pay the penalty that I get very little information. So the answer is, do this experiment many, many, many times. Do for each time this weak measurement in the middle, write the result, and then keep only those results that ended up finding sigma y equals to plus 1. Collect only those result from the sub-ensemble, add them up, then you will see that each one of them contributes indeed the square root of 2. That is a miracle. The miracle is that when you do a weak interaction proportional to epsilon, the disturbance in the system goes like epsilon square. Therefore, if I have a weak information that is 1 over n. I have to do at least n experiments to see it. But the disturbance 
those as epsilon square, therefore if n is very large, there will be no disturbance. I will be able not to disturb sigma x and sigma y, and never, nevertheless see the various squares of two. So let me prove it, that it can be done. <coughs> I'm using the formulation for Neumann for measurement. So the interaction between the measuring device and the system that is measured, I have a Q coordinate for the measuring device. I have an observable A for the system. I have a coupling delta of T times some coupling strain G. And the time evolution for this is e to the i g q times a. That, that time evolution, if I multiply the state of the system and the state of the measuring device, the a acts on the state of the system. So if the system is an alien, uh, the vector is a value of a, there will be a number a here. And this will be a translation operator on the pointer of phi, which is the momentum conjugate of u. So if d is very strong, This is supposed to represent the state of the pointer, where PQ is the coordinate of the pointer. So when I make this measurement, the pointer will move. I'm just saying that it should have been called inexact measurement, because that's the important thing. It can be as strong as you want, as long as it's, it's still inexact, no? Uh, we can argue about this later, OK? So, um, so what happens? If G is large, and psi is an alien, uh, alien vector of A, then it will move here by a distance G times the alien value. And that is called the strong measurement. The question is now, what happens when I do a weak measurement? The weak measurement will make, make this move by a very small amount compared to its uncertainty. And let's calculate that small amount. So I assume now that G is very small, so I can replace it by epsilon. So I have one e to the i epsilon u times a, which can be approximated as one plus i epsilon q a. And, and we can, if epsilon is sufficiently small, we can reject second order of epsilon. So I have my time evolution of the interaction between the system and the measuring device. It's 1 plus i epsilon qa. And I multiply it by the state of the system and the state of the measuring device. So I assume that the state of the system was psi 1. And then I find at the end the state psi 2. For simplicity, I neglect the time evolution of psi 1 and psi 2. And that's, actually, this is psi 1 and psi 2 at the time when I made a measurement. And the question is, uh, is now, if I do the pre and post selection, psi 1, psi 2, what will be the remaining effect on the measuring device? So I see that that thing is equal to psi 2 times psi 1 from the 1, and then plus i epsilon q times psi 2 
a psi 1 a and all this has to be multiplied phi. So looking at this expression here, I take psi 2 psi 1 out. This is the thing that tells me what is the probability amplitude to find from the initial state to find the final state. But it does not affect the measuring device. So I can take psi 2 times psi 1 out. And I'm left with 1 plus <coughs> IQ psi 2 a psi 1 divided by psi 2 psi 1. And then it multiplies the measuring device. So look what's happening here, and there is an epsilon. So I, I named this quantity psi 2 a psi 1 divided by psi 2 psi 1, the weak value of A that depends on both state psi 1 psi 2. So up to now, we had a physics average value and alien values. Now we have a new kind of value, which is a weak value that we find when we make measurements at intermediate time, given two boundary conditions and doing the measurement sufficiently weak so we don't destroy the two boundary vectors. And you see, I can then write that C as psi 1, psi 2, multiplied by e to the minus i epsilon q a weak. Because I can go back to uh, using this as an exponential. And that thing now is a translation operator of the pointer pq by the value a weak. So this was the, uh, the probability for pq. It is translated by epsilon but multiplied by a wish. And therefore, if I repeat many, many experiments, eventually, indeed, I will see that the system moved as if it has a property, the measuring device moved as if the system has a property a wish. Let us check back our original question. What is the weak value of sigma x plus sigma 1, y? which value, if I have the initial condition sigma x is equal to 1, and I have the final condition sigma y is equal to 1, I want to calculate the weak value of sigma x plus sigma y. So I have to take this and divide it by the scalar product sigma y equal to 1, times sigma x is equal to 1. Now, because this is a negative set of sigma x, I know that sigma x acting on this will give me 1. And this is a negative set of sigma y. Sigma y acting on this will give me 1. So indeed, the answer here will be 2. So our guess was right. Indeed, sigma x is equal to 1 and sigma y is equal to 1, provided you do experiment that does not destroy any of them. Under this condition, both of them are valid, and we get a new kind of physics where we say that quantum system intermediate time has new kind of property, which is this interesting new property that I called weak values. It has many, many interesting features. For example, the first important feature that plays a role in many experiments now is that when you see the denominator, psi 2, psi 1, 
this denominator goes to zero, you find suddenly that the weak value can be much, much bigger than even the maximum alien values. So the weak value, if you can measure it, can give you uh, new information about systems that usually will be very difficult to find. Of course, you pay the penalty that you have to use a very large intensity to see it. But these experiments are done now in many, many laboratories in the world, and there are very interesting things that can be happening. In fact, some of these experiments were done by people at Rochester, like uh, John Owl, and that is one outcome that is interesting. But, <clears throat> and there were, by the way, other developments. One of them was the thing that's called super oscillation. The other is the thing that I invented that's called quantum work. So there are many, many results that came out of this um, way of looking at physics. And I want to say now a very important lesson that is learned from that. Remember the initial starting point. We had two boundary conditions, Psi 1 and Psi 2. And in the usual language, Psi 1 was involving in time up to here, and then from here on, Psi 2 was involving in time. In the new picture, we had these two vectors like that. So we had two different stories, the usual story and this new story. Both stories, of course, lead to the same calculation. If we, if we do the, if we consider any experiment and do the result of calculating the probability for this experiment using the usual conventional report, which is just one vector, you will get the right answer just as well as when we do the two-vector formulation. So what's the difference? The difference between the two stories is what happens before you consider experiments. Before I consider experiments, then I have two pictures, two vectors or one vector. The two different stories that we tell here lead us to ask different questions. So you see, when you have a mathematical formulation, like Schroeder equation, that mathematics can answer you any question that you ask. But it can never tell you which, which question to ask, what are interesting questions to ask the formalism. So interpretation of story are very important because a good story will lead you to ask interesting questions. So if we would, in the case of the two spins, the boundary condition. If I well, kept all the story sigma x equal to 1 here and sigma y equal to 1 here, it will never occur to me to ask the question to measure here sigma x plus sigma y and uh, to find the value 2. I would be never, I will never come to this question. It's a test that for close to, I don't know, many, many, 80 years, nobody asked this question because nobody looked at quantum mechanics in this new way. So the difference between a good story and another story is a good story leads you to ask interesting new questions that otherwise you would not ask. OK, now I want to start to show you, yes. Uh, so, so you have a situation where the uh, weak value uh, that you get from an operator is out of what you would expect it to be. Yeah. Two in one. Yeah. And it can be an, an any number. Yeah. Between one and... Uh, At infinite, yeah. And, and, and you have the number of uh, times you need to do the measurement because... Yeah, the, 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 yes. Can you... Uh, yeah, there is a connection because the, 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 the amplitude if the amplitude to get the final thing 
of the probate, we can find out that it's very, very small. I understand, but what I'd like to ask is, is there a mathematical relation? Yeah, there is a mathematical, there's that mathematical relation between the number of experiments you have to do and the, and the denominator being smaller. The smaller the denominator is, you have to do more experiments to so see it. In, in the case that you gave, the, the, the denominator wasn't that small, the overlap of sigma x equals plus one and sigma y equals plus one was not that small. Uh, the outcome was quite impressive. You get two instead of one. Uh, how many times you need to carry out the measurement in order to get the in order to do it as a when they exponentially find. more, is it linearly more? That's what you are. Yeah. <coughs> no, the number of times that you have to do is linear. I mean, if you, it's, if the scalar product of the two is, say, equal to uh, one half, say, mm -hmm. then we found that if you, like in the shadow of spin, that about 20 experiments are the minimum that you need to see to begin to see something new. Uh, yeah, you will need to see that sigma x plus sigma y is divided by square root 2 is larger than 1 if you have at least uh, 20 or 30 experiments with the right boundary condition. But, of course, in the experiments that are actually in Daniel laboratory, what you use is you use a beam of photons and then you have a huge number of photons, there is no problem. Yeah. But we can discuss it more privately. I will show you the details. OK. Now, the first interesting example of something new is what we, happens when we consider three cavities, or three boxes. And suppose you have a particle which is in superposition equally in the three boxes. So it's this box number one, this box number two, this box number three, you start at the state one over square root of three times one plus two plus three. <coughs> and then this is the time t1. At a later time t2, you do a post reaction and you find the state one plus two minus three. So now if you calculate the weak values, the weak value of the projection operator here is 1. The weak value of the projection operator here is 1. But the weak value of the projection operator here is minus 1, because the sum must be equal to 1. And the new, interesting, the new really interesting question is, how should it be interpreted this negative weak value here? And I want to suggest something very dramatic. I want to say that when we get the weak value of projection operator to be minus 1, it is really telling us that if we do a careful experiment not to destroy the two boundary conditions, what will be sitting in this box is a particle that has the opposite, it just, it is an electron. What is sitting here is a particle that is the negative image of the electron. It has the opposite charge of the electron. It has negative mass equal in size to the mass of the electron. It, and even its inertial mass will be negative. How, how can we give a meaning to that? And what will that interpretation lead into? So first of all, how do I make a weak measurement for the projection operator? On the, I, have a I have a cavity here. I know that inside the cavity there is a particle. I want to make a weak measurement to find what is, the, what is sitting here. I certainly cannot open this box and look what is inside here, because that will be a strong measurement, obviously. So what can I do? Well. One possibility, if this is a charged particle, I can measure what electric field this charged particle 
produce outside. Luckily enough, from the case of electron, we know that the electric field that it produces for a finite time outside here is much, much smaller than the quantum uncertainty of the vacuum. How do I know this? I know that I can do an interference experimental electron. That is done in the laboratory. Now, the electron moves either here or here. In order to see the interference pattern, there should be no way to know whether it moved this way or that way. But if it moved this way, the electric field it produces here is different from the electric field produced by the other branch. If that electric field could be observed, then that will destroy the interference. And we know the interference does, is not destroyed. We know, therefore, the electric field that we, the electric field produced by electron is much smaller than the quantum uncertainty of the electric field during the vacuum uncertainty of the electric field during this time. Otherwise, we could not see interference. So therefore, the electric field, if we can think about the electric field outside as a weak measurement of the charge inside. Weak measurement because for individual case, the pointer, which is the electric field here, is moving by much less than its uncertainty. So we have now a possibility of making weak measurement of what is inside by looking at the electric field. We can also make a weak measurement much, much weaker measuring the gravitational field. And now I claim that if you do that, measure the electric field here, record it, then do it for a second experiment, for a third experiment, collect only the results where the final boundary condition was dead, and lo and behold, you will find from the collection of all these answers that indeed the particle was sitting here produces an electric field as if it had a positive charge, producing a gravitational field as if it has a negative mass, and there is other argument that we show that this inertial mass must be also negative. This is amazing. It's telling us now that in a very natural way, when we look at boundary condition of this type, we find new kinds of particles. Can we see some interesting experimental evidence for this, apart from this weak measurement? I mean, I talk about thought experiments right now. So let me tell you first about what we named the quantum Cheshire effect. I'm just curious, how many people here have read Alice in Wonderland? Can you raise your hand? Not everybody? Most people, okay. You know in that story, Alice is coming to this wonderful world where animals can talk, and among other, one time she meets a cat that came from Cheshire. That's, Cheshire is some region in England, that's why she's called so Alice is talking with the cat, and after a while, she annoys the cat, and the cat decides to disappear. But he does it in a very funny way. First the tail disappears, then the body disappears, then the face disappears, and only the smile of the cat is left. Alice starts to ask herself, to tell herself, I have seen many times a cat with an outer smile. But what does it mean to see a smile without a cat? So everybody that read, this, that read this book, including me, thought, well, this is a crazy writer. How can you see a smile without a cat? And then it turns out that quantum mechanics tells us that indeed you can see a smile without a cat. So let me show you how does quantum mechanics do it. Suppose I have a single electron, and the single electron is described by some, it's a one-dimensional problem. This is psi as a function 
this is x, this is psi of x, and the electron sits here, and it has a spin sigma x equal to plus one. And then I superpose it with another state of the electron sitting here, also with sigma x equal to plus one. So I have a superposition, this is the initial state, psi left plus psi right times sigma x equal to plus one. Psi left is that wave function, psi right is this wave function, and I have a superposition of the two, and in both cases, sigma x is equal to plus one. Then I do a post-selection. This is a time t1, a time t2. The post-selection is the same state here with sigma x equal to plus one, but the state here has sigma x equal to minus one. Obviously, I can find this state because it's not orthogonal to that state. So I can find this final state. Now, let us look at some weak values. If I look here on the weak value of the projection, of, uh, yeah, because I talk about the, weak, the calculation, notice that the scalar product of this state and this state is equal to one. Right? Because this is zero and this is one. So I, I write the state psi left plus psi right because you know when you do weak value calculation, you can normalize the state, the state psi one and psi two by any number that you like. It will not change the ratio. Therefore, I write the initial state as this plus that, not divided by square root of two. And the final state is this plus that, so the scalar product of the two, which is the denominator, is one. So I just need to calculate the denominator to find any weak values. So the, no, the, if I put a projection operator here, I get one times one. So the projection operator on the left is equal to one, the weak value of it. On the other hand, I put a projection operator here, this state is orthogonal to that, therefore the projection operator here, the weak value on the left is equal to zero. Okay, so far no surprise. That means that I have, if I look, I will find the part here. I will mean, not find the part here, here because these two boundary conditions slash with each other. Now, let me slight modify the situation to make the calculation e easier. I will multiply this by one, but this by square root of two. So I start with psi left, plus square root of two, psi right. And the same thing here. This is one, and this is square root of two. This will not change the denominator, and still I will get zero here. But now, suppose I calculate the weak value of sigma z. I want to calculate the weak value of sigma z. So if I calculate here, sigma z takes sigma x plus one to sigma x minus one. So the weak value of sigma z on this side gives me zero. On the other hand, the weak value here will change sigma x plus one if I, to sigma x minus one, and then I will get the value two. If I calculate sigma x equal to one, sigma z, sigma x equal to minus one, then this is equal to, to one, right? Because sigma z changes sigma x plus one to sigma x minus one. So because of the square root of two, I find that sigma z weak is equal to two. Here, five, yeah. Five minutes? Huh? Five minutes? 
Really? I, I, <laughs> okay, I thought there's exactly one quarter of what I needed to say, but I have one more talk, so maybe I will repair it. Okay, so that will be the end of this story. Okay, so let us look at the operator one plus sigma z divided by two. Usually this operator is equal to the probability to find sigma z equal to plus one. So, so if I look at the weak value of this, that will be the, the probability or the projection operator weak value on sigma z equals to plus one, this one gives me zero because there is no particle there. That, you see, I can write this as the, <coughs> the projection operator on plus, okay. The, uh, the one here is the thing that is the sum of the projection operator of plus that's the projection operator of minus. That is equal to zero because I could not find the particle there. So therefore, the weak value of finding the particle with sigma z equal to plus one on the right is equal to one because that's two over two. And the weak value to find the particle on the right with sigma z equal to minus one is minus one if I subtract it. So therefore, the picture is that on the right, I have just a single electron sitting here. On the left, I find that there are a positive L particle and a negative particle, because the projection operator of sigma z equal to plus one is positive. The projection operator of minus one is negative. They have both exactly the same wave function. So I have here this kind of wave function for two particles. One particle, normal particle, and the other particle that has the opposite properties. So I have a pair of particles, one with positive charge and positive mass, one with negative charge and negative mass. They sit together. The charge and the mass cancel each other, but the magnetic moment does not, because the magnetic moment for the negative char particle will be opposite, and therefore there will be just a magnetic moment sitting here at exactly this shape. So if I come here and I do weak measurement, I will find a very interesting uh, structure there. There is only a smile here, only a spin. The spin is like the smile of the particle. I move the spin here with nothing of the particle because there is no charge and no mass. But the right interpretation to think about what is here is that you have a pair of particles, positive and negative, they cancel each other in all aspects apart from the magnetic moment. Now if I come to this new structure and see that it is indeed made of positive and negative particles, how can I do that? And that will be the last thing I will talk today. So I have in this region, I have a positive, a regular particle, a negative particle sitting together, canceling each other apart from the magnetic moment. What will happen now if I put a strong electric field here? The strong electric field will give to the positive, to the normal electron, will give the force in one, the one direction, to the opposite one, since it has the opposite uh, charge, we give a force momentum in the other direction. But because the inertial mass is opposite, they will both be accelerated in the same direction. So I will not be able to separate them by the electric field. But if I put here a inhomogeneous magnetic field, they give a force to the magnetic moment. So to the positive charge that has a positive both of them have the same magnetic moment. So now each one of them will get, get by this force in homogeneous magnetic field a momentum in this direction. 
But lo and behold, the normal electron gets momentum in this direction, goes here. The opposite, the counter electron or the negative electron, will actually, because it goes this momentum, will go in the other direction because it has a negative inertial mass. So that thing will separate them. So I put here this thing, separate them. The positive particle will go this way. The negative particle will go this way. Once they are far away, I do a weak measurement and check that indeed there is a positive particle here, negative particle here. After I did this weak measurement, I reconnect them again by the opposite forces. And finally, I can do the post-selection as if nothing happened. Because in the middle, I test it only by weak values. So again, when I have an ensemble of particles, I can indeed convince myself by weak measurement that indeed I produced here a miracle, a positive and negative particle sitting together, producing only a magnetic moment, and I can show it by experiment in the way that I decided. There are many, many beautiful other examples. Unfortunately, since we are involved with time as a physical object, that time is up. So I have to stop now, and thank you very much. Is, is there time for questions or no more? Maybe one quick question, if someone wants to ask. Yes. Can I yes. very short general comment? The, because of the two time measurements that's on the system, they have to be submitted in some unusual forces. That is, there were actual unusual forces. Can you tell us? Sorry. OK. Press if there were unusual forces and so on. So something. Yeah. So uh, there is a classical analog of this. Just, just uh, the, instead of putting boundary conditions, the usual boundary condition, we, uh, we specify the coordinates and the momenta. There is something called the Catalan boundary condition that we specify the initial coordinate and the final coordinate. Yeah. And we have to give an appropriate key so that the particle will manage to go all the mountains and go and come back. Yeah. And here, something unusual may come. We may deserve most unusual <coughs> kicks or something. There may not be a real connection, but I'm just saying. No, there is, yeah, there is a connection. The connection is the following. That if you have not a single particle, yeah. you, have, you have many maybe particles. Maybe later. Sorry? Maybe later. What? Okay, yeah, there is, yeah, I, I can talk, talk to you privately about this for that. Any other question? Okay. <laughs>